verse 1 and 2, 477. More about Jesus' word I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More is saving fullness. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus. Let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Fear our God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More the saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. We thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you that you did die for us on the cross of Calvary. We give you all the praise for that each and every day of our life as we just have the privilege of praying for people early in the morning and just having that privilege of giving you all the praise for the things you provide for us that you guide and direct us each and every day. And we thank you, Lord, for our pastor, Tom, as he Bring the message this evening that just apply it, that we can apply it to our everyday life. As we take this offering, we give you all the praise for that. For we ask this for your name. Amen. And we'll, we'll have our evening special.
Thank you, Barb, for that beautiful medley, uh, all of it uh, centering in, our, in on our desperate need of Christ, and thank you for the reminder of that uh, wonderful and simple chorus, Christ is all I need. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you again tonight, and it's been a blessed evening as we've been able to, once again, with thanksgiving in our hearts, enter into the gates of God and into the house of God. Know the joy that we have fellowshipping around the realities of Christ. And uh, perhaps one of the more significant things that we will do tonight is our simply recognizing our ongoing and desperate need of Christ in our lives. We certainly need him for salvation. He is the one and only Savior, but we need him every hour as the hymn so beautifully sets forth. And, and we need your words every hour. And so it is a privilege for us to consider the inscripturated word of God again tonight, and we would simply ask for your help as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Our study in James continues tonight. We're presently hovering over a little section consisting of only two verses. I'm speaking again of James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Take a look as I read James 1, 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Uh, James gives us here, again, I love the way that God deals with us. James gives us here the three component parts of true or pure religion. Component part number one, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, a bridled tongue. How <clears throat> can I honor God with my tongue? And how can I minister to and edify and grace others with my tongue? Uh, we looked closely at that. Component part number two, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. This is where we spent our time last week. I have one quick leftover here before we tonight pick up the third component part, namely, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Let me quickly take you back and just for a moment to component part number two, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Uh, we noted that to be an orphan or a widow at the time of James' writing meant that most likely you were desperately poor. You can imagine during that first century in particular when you were, quote, excommunicated or kicked out of the synagogue, can you imagine losing your livelihood because of your love for Jesus? Such was the case for God's people, certainly in the first century and many centuries to follow as well. When you think about all the things that we have and all of the things that they lacked, I guess it's relatively easy for us to recognize and embrace this idea that an orphan and a widow, they were in a peck of trouble. Poor, even desperately so, not as we define the term, but as we see the word used in its biblical setting. No food or a lack of food, and no raiment or a lack of raiment. Uh, our definition of poor is actually and frankly embarrassing. And 
that in light of the fact that we all probably at one time or another have claimed to be among them. I remember uh, many, many years ago teaching at a Christian school. And because I was the main wage earner and because our salary was so low that Ann and I and our growing family actually were dubbed by the government to be living below poverty level. But Luke made it. Were we poor? I believe not. Was I ever concerned, you know, going to bed the night before how I was going to put food on the table for my family? Have I ever come close to making the decision that, hey, I, there, there's probably not enough food for all of us, and so because of the high calling of God on my life, I certainly sacrifice and make sure that my family is fed? Did I ever wonder, not because I'm indecisive, but rather because of the lack of such, did I ever wonder where I was going to get my clothes? In fact, Ann and I would testify to you in light of, you know, my prepping you for this, that uh, we, we were so very rich. I mean, not just spiritually and not just biblically, but we, we, we were rich e even as it relates to physical resources. I have some interesting statistics to you. you some of you may have heard them before because uh, at least the possibility of uh, Dale sharing them with his Sunday school class for he and I have read uh, the very same book. I don't recommend books to you often, but once in a while I do that, and this is certainly one. It's entitled Religious Trojan Horse, and it's written by Brandon House. You'll be interested in, in uh, what, what he writes here. <clears throat> what we call poor in America today is not poor in the biblical sense. The facts noted below refer to people defined as poor by the Census Bureau. This was taken from various government reports. Here, here's the bullet points. Again, interesting. 43% of all poor households actually own their own homes. The average home owned by persons classified as poor by the Census Bureau is a three-bedroom home with one and a half baths, a garage, and a porch or patio. Eighty percent of poor households have an air conditioner. By contrast, in 1970, only 36 percent of the entire U.S. population enjoyed air conditioning. Only six percent of poor households are overcrowded. More than two-thirds have more than two rooms per person. The average poor American has more living space than the average individual living in Paris, London, Vienna, Athens, and other cities throughout Europe. Nearly, 30, nearly three quarters of poor households own a car. 31% own two or more. 90%, 97% of poor households have a color television. Over half own two or more colored televisions. 78% have a VCR or a DVD player. 62% have cable or satellite TV reception. See, honestly, I will tell you that I'm poor before I give up my cable. Eighty-nine percent own microwave ovens, more than half a stereo, and more than a third have an automatic dishwasher. Are there poor? Yes. Yes. But just because someone claims to be poor doesn't mean that they qualify, again, not from my standard or yours, but from God's, again, the biblical standard. We said to God champions those. This is the point. I don't want to distract you with the statistics. We, we said that God champions those who are truly poor. He does. And most often, please note, 
He, he does so through those like us, at least like me, that have more than they need. This is what functions so effectively. By the way, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the first century's church, especially as we read of her in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5. It starts out with this comment, th this comment that they had all things in common, and so some of us are a little bit taken back by that and afraid maybe that it's a push for socialism or even worse, communism no private ownership of anything. But if you look carefully at the text and you follow it through, you have no misunderstandings along those lines. But what you do see is God's plan functioning almost perfectly. That those who had faithfully ministered to those who had not. that those who have been blessed with many physical resources, again, way beyond what they need, would be in a position to be used of God to sometimes even faithfully meet the needs of those who do not have. Again, those who are truly poor, God champions the poor. We ought to be watching, remember, scoping out and watching for particular needs. And when someone is in need, it's... And when someone is in need, I get my binoculars out, I take a look, and when someone is in need, and when it's within the power of my hand to meet that need, then guess what? You do it. Galatians 6.10 certainly comes into play. You recall these words, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. You know, if you're here tonight and you're wondering where your food is going to come from for tomorrow morning, th then I bear responsibility in connection with that. So James, you know, he continues to challenge our thinking, and I suppose that we could go on and consider many other things, but we will... Leave it with James' inspired words, pure religion und undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Component part number three. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Series of questions. Is this one of our daily quests? Do you and I wake up in the morning and passionately pray something like this to our great God? Is this among your and my desires? Is this among your and my commitments? Is this important? To us. James says it absolutely is. And all of James' teaching centers around a particular word. I don't know how many times I've looked at it. Uh, the word ought to ring a bell uh, to you because you have uh, heard not only Pastor Tom cited, but Pastor Landon of recent as well. Every time I look at the term, although there's some uh, basicness to the term, I, I am surprised to see some different nuance of truth, or at least by way of application, something that strikes me and just reminds me again that this book are the words of life and that God, in his miraculous inspiration of the word of God, such inspiration funneled down to every single word and the key word here is keep again to keep oneself unspotted from the world as you explore for just a few moments to turn with me I think you'll see that it warrants the kind of questions that we've already posed are we passionate about this are we getting up in the morning again with the desire or wanting to live our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we 
singing in the morning, Lord, I need thee every hour, starting this hour, and is it our heart's desire that in light of the world in which we live, that we would live out our day in such a way so that God is pleased with us and stated in the negative as we must recognize by James-inspired words, are we living our lives in such a way so that when we get through our day, we have gotten through our day unspotted, unstained, unsoiled. And again, is that a priority to us? Is that important to us. The Greek word for keep is tereo. The word in its fullness means to guard from loss or injury. I love everything about the term. To guard from loss or injury by keeping an eye on it. The word, by the way, is in the present tense, which speaks of habitual action, which means daily. And again, back to our blessed hymn, even, even hourly. Hmm. I, I don't want you to miss the... Well, I'll ask the question, when's the last, thing, when's the last time you actually guarded... When's the last time you actually guarded something? The word means to guard from loss or injury by keeping an eye on. Don't miss the inherent passion and emotion in the term, even the love. The fact of the matter is the more we love something, the greater our desire to keep it, to guard it. And so we actually have the measuring stick of our love. Once again, we don't go very long in our study of the word of God before God graciously hands us another measuring stick so that you and I can determine not only whether or not we love the Lord Jesus Christ, but even the degree to which we love him. Guarding. Guarding here, here, guarding against being spotted or stained or soiled by the world in which we live. And, and two things, please stick with me. And I, I, right now I'm scrambling, you know, to decide what we should do. And we're going to try to do it, even though none of that makes sense to you. And, and this was a new emphasis for me in light of the meaning of the term. Again, I give it to you, to guard, to, to guard from loss or injury by keeping an eye on it. When we get spotted from this world, when we get stained from this world, when we get soiled from this world, we suffer some kind of loss, and we suffer some kind of injury. It's that important. Unless you think that willy-nilly, we can just run around and not worry about such spots and stains and soils, and then, you know, maybe get to the end of that day, or at least the next day, or at least once a week, enter our confession booth and take care of all of the dirt in our lives. Twofold concluding thought, but don't leave me yet. You know, I break all the rules. They taught us, you know, as a teacher, don't use the word concluding. <laughs> Twofold concluding thought. One, we ought to do everything in our power, yea, in his power keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And two, when we get spotted, stained, soiled, we ought to move so quickly for the stain remover. 
Guys, you would be dead if you sat down on your brand new light colored couch and you had all of your goodies ready to watch a football game. Three cans of Pepsi over here and three cans of Pepsi over here. And a bowl of chips and wow. Some knock your socks off sauce. And you take your chips and you dip it in the sauce and before too long the sauce is running not only on and off your shirt but on and off the couch. And you say after the first half of the ball game, because you really can't do anything until halftime, hey, by the way, sweetie, we got a little mess on our brand new light colored couch. Could it be that we care more about a light colored couch than our actual walk? with the Lord Jesus Christ because oh how we would so aggressively open up the cabinet underneath the sink and grab the stain rim of it <laughs> but alas often we're sporting, we're, we're sporting for a significant period of time Things that we know when we think about it are displeasing to God. James says, oh, you got to love the straightforward simplicity of it all. James says, don't get spotted, but when you do, quickly use the divine stain remover. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, thank you. We don't have to scratch our heads and wonder about James in regard to his practical teaching. And so often, and this is true of you, you communicate your truth to us in pictures, and for that we're glad. And this third component part is so very significant. We've gone over it quickly. I pray that that's not a disservice to you. For it'd be hard to overemphasize the import of it. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. That we, God's people, that I, would be unspotted from the world in which I live. Thank you for the high calling of God on our lives. Thank you for the divine provision that you've given to us for when we sin, and oh, that we would be practically clean. We pray for Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand and turn to 443 and sing the second verse. Singing the second verse of 443, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, say thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee. Ask Brother Bill Rogo if he'd please close us in a word of prayer. Bill. Thank you again, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of hearing your word. Holy Spirit, apply it to our hearts and our lives. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses us from all sin. May we use not only daily, minutely, 
hourly that blood. Confess our sins that you might cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Direct as we return home, may we use the words that we've heard throughout this week to live for you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.